Welcome to Dismantling the Pipeline, Strategies for Eliminating Racial Bias. I'm really happy to um, give this webinar and be joined by Dr. Rita Cameron Wedding, who is a Chair of Women's Studies and a Professor of Women's Studies and Ethnic Studies at Sacramento State University. Um, this uh, webinar is basically a deeper dive into the racial bias um, tool that we have in our toolkits, which have been recently updated. The fixed school discipline toolkits and these webinars um, arose out of, you know, seeing different data throughout the state of California, but also through the, um, the requests of different um, community organiz organizers and also educators about how to get at the problems they were seeing. So for instance, in California, 2012 to 2013, um, there were 600,000, more than 600,000 total suspensions. And 43% of all of those suspensions were for willful defiance and disrupt, disruption, which is a, a 48900K in the California Education Code. What is important about that is we will be talking about it more later, but a lot of what you see when you're viewing disproportionality um, is um, that when Offenses are subjective. They um, cause for more um, bias to be netted out. Um, and so when we're talking about reducing implicit bias and eliminating it, this is something that we, we really want to focus on. Um, these are some other um, stats about um, the data in California. African-American students are 6.5 of the total enrollment, but 29.7% of all suspensions. Um, and in response to those numbers, um, the How We Can Fix School Discipline Toolkit was put together, and it is a step-by-step -step guide, and for all of you who are in California, I know we have some people joining us from other places, but for all of you who are in California, the local control funding formula focuses on um, school climate and um, that uh, there's guidance in the fixed school discipline toolkits for meeting that requirement. Additionally, there are tools and samples for implementing alternative discipline strategies um, and also um, interviews with educators and community members who are advocating for alternative discipline strategies and also implementing them successfully or even beginning to implement them successfully in their schools and school districts. Um, you can download them for free at fixschooldiscipline.org slash toolkit, and you can email me for hard copies. Um, and just to go, just, you know, kind of give sort of a review, because we did have another um, implicit bias webinar before, and, um, and with Tia Martinez, and I wanted to show that some of what we're um, talking about and to frame the discussion and um, what Dr. Wedding will be talking to everyone about is that the risk of suspension has gone up, right, for all students since the 1970s, but the, the risks for, on average, right, have gone up from 3.7% to 7.4%, right? Um, but the risk of suspension by the race of the student has gone up very drastically for um, African-American students and also for Latino students, but again, has gone up for all students. Um, and this is especially um, alarming when you look at the, um, the disparate use of out-of-school suspension for students, um, you know, for the, what people just call the mandatory, so the weapon, drugs, violence, with injury suspension. So there's still a dis disparate um, impact, but then when you look at the, for subjective offenses like disruption, defiance, disobedience, those kinds of things, the the gap between um, out-of-school suspensions for white students and out-of-school suspensions for black students is, it becomes very, very drastic. So going from 3.3 of the gap to 9.1 gap. Um, and obviously, as you know, all of this is very important and very relevant now. Um, as a lot of you know, the civil rights the Office of Civil Rights um, in the Department of Education and the Department of Justice released a federal school discipline guidance. Um, and it uh, talks about um, their findings in the civil rights data collection, which collects all of the data from all of the uh, schools throughout the United States. And then um, 
disaggregates them by race, by disability, by um, um, socioeconomic status, um, by the type of school, all sorts of um, collections, and and that data is compiled. And so, if you look at this graph, actually, it's it's one of the ones that really jumped out to us um, is that the you know there's a band of um, African American students for African American students. There's a band um, for um, Latino students, students who are multiracial, white students, etc. And if you look across, what you're seeing is that. Frequently, students of color, while they are a lower percentage of the population, they're a very large percentage of, um, of in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, multiple out-of-school suspensions, and expulsions. And so that is something that we think is very important, especially if we're thinking about um, stopping the school-to-prison pipeline um, and the, its disparate impact. And, and something that really jumped out from the federal school discipline guidance for me, and I think for a lot of people, is that the re this, these disparate numbers um, are, not, um, are not explained by more frequent or more serious behavior by students of color or students with disabilities. So these substantial um, racial disparities are explained by something else, and that something else is what we are trying to get at today. Um, so with that, I am going to turn this over to Dr. Wedding, um, who will um, explain all of this to us further. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to have this conversation. Because as we all know, implicit bias is one of the, it's becoming one of the most recognized issues with regard to its impact and decision making in all of our institutions. Schools are just one. I think it's really important for us to continue to look at schools as not a system that's operating in a vacuum. Schools are, are very much influenced by the societies in which they exist and the culture. The culture of the society is very, very much has an impact on what's happening within, within schools. And so the purpose of this webinar is for me to provide you with a, a snapshot of some of the issues and some of the factors that occur within schools that can have an impact on decision making. So um, one of the things, uh, there are a few things on this very first slide that I, I am noting, and, and language is one, labeling and the differential application of policies and procedures, and of course the impact of the, the institutions, the role that institutions play in, in outcomes. So these are the issues that we're going to talk about today. So next slide. So for the next slide, I wanted to point out that when we think about bias, it's really important for us to not think of it in terms of the historical elements of bias. Historically, when we've, when we've talked about bias, we're talking about the, the, those things that are incontrovertible and blatant. Historical forms of bias are things that you think of when you think back on the pre-civil rights era. Those are things that, that everybody would agree were problematic and were racist. The difference is, in contemporary society, bias doesn't show up like that. It doesn't look like lynching or cross-burning or the use of racial epithets or hate crimes, although it could be many of those things. But typically, it's not. And so a lot of people believe in contemporary society that, that bias is no longer a factor because they don't see those blatant and incontrovertible examples. Instead, when we look at our institutions, we should look at the way language is provided. For example, in this image, we uh, I think most of us probably remember this image. It's from Hurricane Katrina. And when we look at this image, we see one, one individual on the, the left side of the picture, a man is walking through, it says a man is walking through uh, chest deep floods water. Um, and and the, the description of this man is that he's looting. 
So this man who's African American, he's walking through the water, he has groceries that he has acquired somehow, but the description, the, the words of the racially coded language for him is that he is looting. On the right side of the image, we have two people who appear to be white people who are moving through the water. And in this way, they, they are referred to as finding food. So the same thing, just as we saw in this example from Hurricane Katrina, we see very similar things in our schools, how we use language differently to describe different people. Now the interesting thing about that is that we don't do that intentionally, it's, but our biases, the, the extent to which we have unconscious and implicit biases, it causes us to choose words differently. And what happens as a result of this is that many of our records in schools or case notes in, in other systems like child welfare or arrest records or court reports, all of these, these different documents or affidavits become racially coded. And, and I do a lot of work with the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges, and I work with judges all over the country, and the judges will often say, I don't even notice race. I just look at the court reports. But what judges don't realize sometimes is that the court reports are written and composed by individuals like ourselves who have implicit biases. And so it is almost inescapable that these documents are going to be free of bias. The other thing, as I mentioned earlier, is it's important for us to consider how the, the policies and practices are applied differently. Um, using this, this same slide, I want to go on and say a couple of more things. And that is that in schools, we have to note that the, the way that biases influence our thinking will have a direct impact on outcomes in education. For example, we all know, and, I, and Sarah mentioned that, the impact of um, just the, the terminology related to willful defiance. The terminology related to willful defiance. Um, the perceptions of willful defiance, which, is, which can be a very subjective terminology, will be very directly linked to impl our implicit biases. Another thing that will be impacted by our implicit bias is the referrals that teachers make in school, whether or not they decide to refer a student to the principal's office or whether or not they decide to handle a situation as a teachable moment. A teachable moment is what m most of us were, most of us benefited from when the teacher just took that opportunity to talk to us, like when we had some, some sort of disciplinary infraction, they would just have a conversation. But implicit bias will cause the teacher, can cause the teacher to decide to go to a higher level, and that is a referral to the principal. Um, other things that can be impacted by implicit bias are student placement, whether or not a student is, is considered to have some sort of disciplinary problems or whether or not the student is considered a gifted student. You know, the perception of whether or not the student is a, a gifted, very smart and, and should be in a, a higher placement. All of those things can be influenced by our unconscious biases. The other thing, too, that's a, important to point out is that um, of the decisions that result in suspension, over 43 percent of suspensions are, are directly linked to willful defiance. And, and many of these things are very subjective things, such as students turning on their cell phones, violating dress codes, talking back to the teacher, profanity, tardiness eye-rolling, etc. Now the reason that this is important to note is that willful defiance is a very subjective infraction. It could be almost anything. And this is why so many schools across the country are now looking at banning the use of, of willful defiance as a category for dis school disciplinary action. We can go to the next slide. Great. And somebody also um, raised the point, which was really interesting, that um, she thought it was interesting that they would call um, the person on the left a man because he looks so young. And 
um, was saying oh. that this is also, you know, how language is used where we treat um, children of color like adults yes. through the use of harsher punishment. And that yes. was, I thought, was a pretty good point. Yeah, very good point. All right, next slide is up. So um, I used to say when I started doing this work years ago, when I first started working with the concept or the idea of implicit bias, because the research was not as plentiful as it is now, I used to make the, the comment in just that it's not rocket science. We can just think about it and start to understand it. But what's great now is that it may not be rocket science, but it is neuroscience. In other words, um, there has been a great deal of science that has gone into understanding how our brains function when we are experiencing certain things. And so now there's a great deal of science to back up the implicit bias. And as a matter of fact, um, implicit bias, using implicit bias, individuals who are dealing with certain particular court cases are winning court cases all over the country because this, this is, implicit bias is in fact, the, this is modern racism. This is how racism can preserve the same status arrangement in the year 2014 that we had prior to the Civil Rights Movement. Now, when we look at this slide, I, there's a the quote here that I'm going to read the quote because I think it is so interesting, and I, I'm sure all of you can see it on your screens. But it's, I, it's so important, I think it is worth underscoring. And it, go, it's, it goes, if scientists could scan our brains when we see spiders or snakes, they would see that the area of our brains that focuses on fear, threat, anxiety, and distrust is triggered, or as neuroscientists say, activates. Studies have shown that the same area of the brain activates more when people see pictures of African-American faces than when they see pictures of Caucasian ones. And, and what the science on this says is that when they, they can actually, um, in, in, in the studies, when they've actually looked at our brains under MRIs, when they've done MRIs, there's an area of the brain that lights up when it experiences fear. And so that's what this particular science is, is pointing out, that when people experience fear, their brain lights up. And the, the other part of that is that when they experience, when they see images of African Americans, they are more likely to have, their brains are more likely to light up than when they um, experience or see pictures of other groups. Um, the one thing I want to add to that, the one thing I want to add to that is that whites with relatively high levels of implicit bias are more likely to see African Americans are threat as threatening. And I think this helps to explain why we have more, why the perception of risk and the perception of delinquency and disruptive behavior um, has a greater impact on African American students. We can go to the next slide. It's up. So as I pointed out earlier, it's really important for us to look at how exactly does bias show up in our, in our schools today. So if it's not through those blatant and incontrovertible acts of discrimination, what does it look like? What does it look like in our language? So I wanted to provide you with some examples of that. Uh, one example is um, some groups are described by race and others are not. Once again, we don't do that intentionally. We just do it. It's, it's almost subliminal. So the, the example that, that I'm going the first example that I'm going to show you is an example that I heard from a, a group of individuals when they, they talked about how children are described in their schools. And, and they said typically when they're talking about uh, African American kids or Hispanic kids or children of color, the, the race of the or ethnicity of the child is named. When they're talking about a white child, on the other hand, they just say something like seven-year-old boy instead of naming the race. So that's really an interesting thing for us to consider. Another example of how language can, how bias can show up in language and the way that we, we choose words 
is um, oftentimes if a child is upset, if, the, if it's a white child, or if it, I would say upset, if it's a white child, we will use the word upset. And if it's a black student, we tend to use a word like angry or aggressive or hostile. And that is very consistent with what I just said a few minutes ago about the fact that um, whites with relatively high levels of implicit bias perceive blacks as more threatening. So the implicit bias can influence the language that we choose. And, and the language that we choose will drive the next decision that we make. Uh, the other example is disparities in how reports are written and interpreted. So in this example, we see this, this kind of like innuendo uh, or connotation. If you are describing drug involvement between children, and the, it can be described this way. If the reference is to a white student, we also see this, by the way, in other systems. So we've seen this in systems like child welfare. So this, it cuts across every system. So this is an example for education. The white student is often described as having no drug involvement, which really seems like it's very definitive, very clear cut. The black student, on the other hand, is described as student alleges no drug involvement. So once again, we can see how just the use of that word alleges changes the entire connotation. It changes the, the believability of, of you know, whether or not the student is, in fact, involved in drugs. So we can have the next slide. Um, again, we have the effect on language, labeling, and laws. Another example of how language can distort the fact is, facts is you know the the way that we choose words. We tend to choose words that, in fact, if you look in look at many school reports, the language gets harsher when we're talking about people of color, and in this case, students of color. Um, I have seen examples where the child actually had a knife. They brought a. I'm sure many of you have seen this. The child brought a a knife to school. Um, or the child may have brought nail clippers or something to that effect. But in the report, it doesn't say that the child brought a knife or the child had a knife. What it says is the child was wielding a knife or the child was brandishing a knife, which changes the entire connotation of the event. Um, another example was in working with judges, one judge said um, that he had a client or a gentleman in the courtroom who was volatile. And I've asked people across the country in many different audiences how they would describe the word volatile. And many of them will say, well, when I think of volatile, I think of something or someone who's explosive. I think of something that's about to explode. And what was interesting about the conversation with the judge, he chose the word volatile. And I would have expected, since he used that word, that he was going to tell me the rest of the story, which I would have imagined was going to be a story about how he had to move the father from the courtroom because of some larger event that took place. And since he didn't have that follow-up, I'm assuming that he could have chosen the word upset instead of volatile. So I just want to offer that as a way to get people to think about how are we choosing language? How are these these, these words showing up in school records. And not only in terms of the words that you are writing, but think about the words that you are reading in, in a student's file. If you are reading words like wielding and brandishing or volatile, that is going to really change how you perceive the event compared to if you are using words in language that has a lesser impact, but is more specific and more accurate to the event. Again, words like uncooperative, making sure that we are using words that are very specific and descriptive rather than ambiguous and highly subjective. And then finally, let's, let's think about the extent to which our language impacts the ways that laws are written. Um, um, in, in our culture throughout the country, we have um, a youth culture that enjoys, you know, not all youth, but many youth who enjoy wearing their pants 
very low hung um, with their belt around their thighs instead of their waist oftentimes. Now, in every culture, every youth culture from probably the beginning of time, children or teenagers, adolescents have wanted to differentiate themselves from older people. I personally know that I have an implicit bias about that. I know that. So I have to really work hard on, I have to work very hard on not judging my students and their abilities to be, their ability to be a good scholar based on whether or not their pants are sagging. So that's one thing and that's, that's one of the, the biases that I am aware that I have and I try to be mindful of it so when a student comes into my office I am not assuming that they cannot be an excellent scholar because of the way they wear their pants. On the other hand, there's a larger issue, and that issue is there are some jurisdictions across the country who have turned that, that situation into more than just a cultural experience of you, and that is that you know, there, there are some jurisdictions that can charge that behavior with indecent exposure. I exposure. Or in the case of, so in other words, we have situations in which laws can, you know, the way that, that the language used in laws can, can result in, in a differential application. In other words, a child watching a fight in one jurisdiction is simply a child watching a fight. Someplace else, that child watching a fight, that might be a, a, a violation of a law. And in one jurisdiction, the violation of that law is inciting a riot. So once again, to just underscore the fact that language is very, very powerful. All right, next slide. So colorblindness is a very important, so we, we've, we've got four factors that we're dealing with. And all four of these factors, and I'm going to list them, all four of these factors can explain how we can preserve biases in education in the year 2014. The first one we've talked about, and that is implicit bias, which really amounts to the fact that we all have these unconscious biases that we are often unaware of. Most people are fully, totally unaware that they have implicit biases. And for those, if there are any of you in the in participating on, on this webinar who have, have not um, thought about it, I would highly recommend that you take the Harvard Implicit Association test, you can just uh, Google the Harvard IAT test and you can take one of the sample tests. Um, but I think it's really important for, for us to really get beyond these, you know, the impact of implicit bias in the scope of our own individual decision making and institutional decision making. I think we have to recognize how our biases show up. And like I said before, mine will show up and, and some of the most, you know, when I think about it, some of the things are embarrassing to admit, but those are my implicit biases and, and everybody, every, each of you will have your own. Uh, so implicit bias is one of the factors. Colorblindness is another factor. Um, the reason colorblindness is so, the reason colorblindness is so important is because it can mass, colorblindness can mask the public discourse on race and make it difficult for us to talk about race. Essentially, colorblindness says we shouldn't talk about race, we shouldn't think about race because we're all on a level playing field. But it also says something else. It says, but whoever mentions race first is a racist in the room. The reason uh, we have to be mindful of colorblindness is because a lot of us have been conditioned to think that if we don't talk about race, if we don't make it explicit, there won't be a problem. As a matter of fact, I'm sure many of you know people who have said to you, why don't, why don't we still talk about race? If we'd stop talking about it, we wouldn't have a problem. So I want, we're going to show a, a very short clip, and it's called A Girl Like Me. And the reason that I want to show this clip is because this gives us an opportunity to see how even though we are, ourselves may not want to talk about race, uh, the, you know, what the literature tells us is that even in the, the silencing of race, even in the non-mention of race, the racialization process continues. So this is a girl like me.
Brown versus Board of Education, the famous case that desegregated schools in the 1950s, Dr. Kenneth Clark conducted a doll test with black children. He asked them to choose between a black doll and a white doll. In most instances, the majority of the children preferred the white doll. I decided to reconduct this test, as Dr. Clark did, to see how we've progressed since then. Can you show me the doll that you like best or that you like to play with? children preferred the white doll. So oh, that's, that's, that's an example, example of, of color, color blindness. Yeah. So we so can, we go, can go, go to the next slide. slide. So the next slide is stereotypes. Um, again, so this is the this is the third factor. So implicit bias, colorblindness, stereotypes, and on this one, I want to start with just talking about how the media representations of African Americans and other groups. Usually, when I'm I'm in a face-to-face -face training, I will give my students an opportunity to to brainstorm the stereotypes that they've heard about groups. So we've all heard them, and and you can just think about what they what they sound like in your, you know, in your mind. Um, but I want to share with you this piece of research, and it's a research on on implicit bias and public uh, public attitudes findings. And it goes like this: It says where a black perpetrator was shown in the media, seventy percent of the subjects recalled a black perpetrator. Where no perpetrator was shown, 60% recall seeing a perpetrator, and 70% of those recall seeing a black perpetrator. Where subjects were shown a white perpetrator, 10% recall seeing a black perpetrator. And I think that gives us a great opportunity to think about the impact that, that race, that, that racialization has on our thinking. I think, you know, I often say that stereotypes are ubiquitous. They're, in other words, they're all over the place. They are inescapable. They are part of every aspect of our popular culture. And whether, you know, I have students who have said to me, well, I, you know, I don't, like the judge, I don't know this race, or, or they might say something like, I don't have any biases. But the reality is, is it is hard to escape having biases if you are part of this culture because they have been, you know, the stereotypes that have informed us and the stereotypes that inform our implicit biases have been around since the very beginning of time. I want to read this quote to you and then I'm going to show a, a very brief video. When I turn on the news each night, what do I see again and again? Black men alleged to be killing, raping, mugging, stabbing, gangbanging, looting, rioting, selling drugs, pimping, hoeing, having too many babies, dropping babies from tenement windows, fatherless, motherless, godless, penniless. I believe we have become so used to this image of the black male predator that we are forever ruined by this brainwashing. I like to read that quote because I think it does a really good job of summarizing how ubiquitous stereotypes are, and and I I would I would like to offer a challenge to everyone, every participant on this webinar, 
to think about what your implicit biases look like and think about how your implicit biases can influence your decision making. Okay, we're going to show another short clip and it's called Psychology of Stereotypes. Categorize people automatically, unconsciously, immediately based on a person's race and based on a person's sex. It begins in childhood. We brought together three groups of kids at this day camp and showed them pictures of two men, one Arab, the other Asian. What do you like better, this man? Or this man? The Chinese guy. Again and again, more kids prefer the Asian man. He looks neater, he looks nicer. Because he looks nicer? Yeah, he does look nicer. And he has a, he has a smile. But both men are smiling. And what do the kids think about the personalities of the men? Let me ask, you don't know this person, but what do you think he's like? I think he's weird. Why is he weird? He just doesn't look like a very nice person. No. He looks like a scary baby. He's on the phone. What's he talking about? Maybe a robbery? What's he like? He looks like a regular teenager to me. We then showed the pictures of a black man and a white man. What were some comments about the black man? He looks mean. FBI moved on. He looks mean. He looks like he's a basketball player. So, tell me about this guy. Does he seem like a nice person? I think he's nice. I think he's nice, except he might be mad about something. He was probably picking up on something. This is Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh. Admittedly, the pictures are a little different. But when we ask which man is a criminal, most kids pointed to the black man. And when we asked which was a teacher, they said, That one! That one is a teacher! Which is ironic, because he's a Harvard professor. Of course, we adults claim not to have these biases. But so, the power, the power of stereotypes. I think, I think each, each of us, us can think about how stereotypes have impacted our own thinking. And I think particularly in school environments, if we could get every edu educator to really think about how their, their implicit biases that are informed by their stereotypes influence their decision making, I think we would achieve a lot in terms of reducing disproportionality in, in terms of school suspensions. One of the things that I, I add, I have for this next slide that's coming up, um, I wanted to point out how stereotypes can actually construct criminality. Um, on this slide, I have a list of examples. I have dreadlocks, swagger, sagging pants. All of these things can affect how we perceive students, particularly depending upon our, our, the level of our own implicit bias. To the right side, by the way, is an image of a book called Bad Boys. Um, public schools in the making of black masculinity. And, and I use this as one of my sources because um, Ann Ferguson talks about the fact that, that this, this whole idea of, of um, the African American youth and the criminalization of black boys is a constructed ideology. And I think one of the ways that it's constructed is because a lot of the characteristics that we associate with African American boys are, are used to define and describe them either in terms of their, you know, kids who are um, disproportionately disciplined in schools and the kids who end up in the juvenile justice system. So I want to talk for a second about hairstyles. I was working with a, a jurisdiction in which we had law enforcement from the Highway Patrol, we had uh, the police department, we also had probation in the room and individuals from other um, institutions like child welfare. But uh, one of the individuals who was a uniformed officer, he said that one of the ways that he can actually determine issues like um, reasonable suspicion is by the way individuals wear their hair. I, I mean, th th this was a room with a, at least a hundred individuals. And I think most of us were really stunned by the fact that somebody would actually make that explicit. 
And so I asked the question, what, do you, what exactly do you mean by hairstyles? Because he said, I, you know, we can use hairstyles as a way to you know, determine um, reasonable suspicion. And I said, what exactly does that mean? And he was trying to describe it, but the point is this. It's like, if in fact we are using characteristics such as hairstyles to determine you know, who's more likely to, to commit a crime or who's more likely to get in trouble, then that's, that's another way that African American students can be uh, disproportionately disadvantaged. Another example that Anne Ferguson uses is the way they, they walk. She describes that she actually gets, goes into detail about the, 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 the I want to say countenance, I'm not sure if that's the word, but there's a, a rhythm or a way that some African American boys walk and that is, you know, that can cause teachers to, you know, not be comfortable with them because a lot of the, the characteristics that I'm describing on this page are things that can be associated often, more often, with African American boys. But the interesting thing about the swagger, the walk, is I, I think our president has a little bit of that, that little swagger. So it's not just boys who get in trouble. It can also be boys who end up being very, very successful. We talked about sagging pants. Dialect is one. The research tells us that people can be very uncomfortable with individuals who have a particular dialect. Um, that is different than the, the white middle class dialect. Uh, I had an interesting situation that came up at the university a couple of weeks ago, and that is um, a, an instructor, a professor actually told one of our students that she should write more. You know, this was something with regard to writing style, and the, the professor told the student that she should write, write more like a white middle class woman. So, and of course, you know, there are a lot of issues associated with that, but the point is, is that there are lots of biases that can go into decision making in, in schools. So, so that's stereotypes. So that's the, you know, the, I think that's one of the, the key issues, the third one, but now we can move on to the fourth one, which is institutions. And this is the one, and we, We'll develop this and then we will go into some strategies. Now the reason that this is so important is because we have to understand back to one of the first things I said when we started, and that is that schools do not operate in a vacuum. Schools are schools take in information that they get from other systems. They take in information and in, that they get from other systems in the form of documents as well as norms that we have generally in our society. And so what, you know, I often say what happens in one major social institution will be a decision point that will influence outcomes in the next social, in the, in the next um, major social institution. So, so what happens in schools will have a direct impact on kids who are involved in multiple systems like juvenile justice or uh, child welfare because they're, they're, in other words, they're going to be using the same information, the same reports, and that is why it's so important that what we write is accurate and specific and descriptive rather than subjective and judgmental. One of the things that has been highly problematic for our youth is that one of the, the, the cultural norms in our society in general is that we, because of the campaigns on the war on drugs, um, being tough on crime, zero tolerance policies, we have gotten into this, this over, I would say, over criminalization of youthful offenses, things that used to be considered kids will be kids behaviors, things that have been, you know, kids have done from the beginning of time, and now all of a sudden these things are being criminalized or labeled as being criminal activities rather than just, you know, kids will be kids behaviors. Um, there are many schools across the country who are using um, school resource officers. School resource officers are police officers who are working in schools. They're not there to take the place of, of counselors, but in many cases their contact with school, with, with children on a daily basis can change the culture of the school environment. So schools, which used to be high, highly known and valued for 
their, their primary function, which is education, or even socialization, the fact that we're socializing, socializing kids to, to be good citizens, for example. What, what we have to keep in mind now is that whatever values we have around the children that we're serving, that is going to have a direct impact on the way that we structure the school environment. So on this slide, I have criminalization. And I'm saying that having the police nearby can transform the daily school experience. And so all of a sudden now, fighting, and no one is, is advocating that fighting is good. Um, we know that it's not a good thing. But we also know that there's not a generation that has existed where fighting has not occurred. And by the way, I should point out that the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention um, in its conference last year talked about the fact that only about 3% of the expulsions in schools are um, related to school violence. Most of the suspensions in even many of the expulsions are related to things that are not um, guns or weapons or things of that nature. But we have a situation in which we have transformed the daily ex the school experience so that fighting in the hallway has now become a, a battery or swiping a classmate's cell phones is now a theft or a robbery or talking back to an officer or a teacher is now disorderly conduct and this can result seamlessly into arrest. If you see the picture on the right hand side, there's an image and if you look closely in a face-to-face -face training, I usually ask my, ask the participants to describe what they see. And I will describe it for you. I want you to, to look closely. We see a little girl and we see it, what appears to be three individuals surrounding the little girl. So essentially, there are three police officers. There's a little girl. This is an educational environment. If you look the, if you look even more closely, you will probably start to wonder what exactly is happening with this little girl. And I will tell you that the child, this is a child, she's a five-year-old baby girl. I say baby girl because at five, children have to be protected. They have to be supervised. They have to be watched over. So this is a five-year-old child who is, um, is being arrested. So the obvious question that participants have now is, um, well, why is she being arrested? And I want to pose that question to you. And the, the, the question is, what, what do you imagine she must have done? And I want you to think about this question. What do you imagine she must have done to have warranted her arrest? What must she have done? Not what you think, but what is the the one or two things that you can imagine that would justify arresting a five-year-old baby girl. And what most people come up with is that she must have a gun. She must have had a gun. She must have had a weapon. She must be part of that 3% of kids who are about to participate in school violence. So I want to say a couple of things about that. Number one, she did not have a gun or a weapon of any kind. Number two, I want you to now think back on the, the statement, that, the couple of statements that I made earlier about the perceptions that people have of, of when they have a high level in, of implicit bias. I'm going to reread that to you, which is, and, and, and this, this research says, Whites with, a relatively, with relatively high levels of implicit bias can perceive blacks to be more threatening. I do, I strongly believe that implicit bias lay, led this, these decision makers to think that this child was of such a great risk that they had no option but to call the police. But I also want to add another piece to that and say that, that even though the research spoke specifically about whites, I think we should recognize that it's not just white people who have implicit bias. All of us have implicit biases. And, then, and we can have, I am African American, I can have implicit biases towards people who look like me. So it's, that is, we, it's so important for us to put that on the table. And that is why implicit bias is so powerful, is because it can impact anyone. 
So here we have a five-year-old girl. The question was, what do you imagine she must have done? Like I said, most people imagine that you know she must have had a gun, didn't have a gun. Her offense was that she had a tantrum. All of us know five-year-old children who have a tantrums, who have had tantrums, or who who we've seen have tantrums. But none of us, I'm sure, would imagine calling the police for a five-year-old child in our life who's having a tantrum. None of us would imagine doing that. But once again, if you are associating this child's behavior with this broader norms, with a, you know, a group of individuals who are more likely to, to be involved in criminal activity, who are more likely to be violent, more likely to be aggressive, then your implicit bias might cause you to, to call the police. I um, asked the question of individuals in the, in the room, so um, when you look at this picture, what do you see? And what one gentleman said, and it will always stick in my brain, he said, when I look at this, when I look at this picture, what I see is a child misbehaving. So again, we have to think about what did we see. Um, but whatever the point is, whatever we see will guide our very next decision. So if you are an individual who's working within school environments, however you perceive a child or a student, whatever your, your implicit biases, um, the level your implicit biases dictate can really distort what you see and whether or not you'd see a child who's dangerous and aggressive or whether or not you, you see a child who needs to be protected and needs help. So the next slide. So this is um, an image of a book, uh, a book cover by Judge Irene Sullivan and it's called Raised by the Courts. That's the name of the book. Raised by the Courts, One Judge's Insight into Juvenile Justice. Um, the reason that I, I like to um, talk about Judge Irene Sullivan is because the, the image that I showed a, a second ago of the little girl, the little five-year-old child in handcuffs. Um, when I first showed that image of the five-year-old in handcuffs, it was in a jurisdiction of social workers, and they were very, very upset. Can we go back to that slide, Sarah, of the child in handcuffs? They were the so Social workers were very upset, and the reason that I think they were very upset is that they, they could not, it's okay if you can, because they could not imagine how or why or who would decide to lock up a five-year-old child. In fact, the child welfare director said, was also very upset because he said, he, he thought that I wasn't telling the, the whole story. In fact, he, would, he said, you're, you're not telling the whole story. There must be more to the story than that. And that was the story. That was the story as I knew it. So a friend of mine said to me, don't ever show that image again because you just make people upset. So the next group that I worked with was a group of judges and there were other high-level officials from throughout the country. And I decided to show the picture again because I thought that people need to know. And this is this image, particular image of the, the girl being handcuffed happened many, many years ago. But we've had so many images since then that, you know, we, we're not at any loss for having, unfortunately, examples to show um, for how we have these disproportionate outcomes in schools. But my friend said, you shouldn't show that picture you, because it upsets people. But in this particular group, I, I showed it. And one gentleman came up to me and he showed me, he handed me his business card and it turned out that he was from, he was from um, the Florida, uh, he was the undersecretary for juvenile justice in the state of Florida. And he actually, he said to me, this happened under my watch. And he was obviously very, very concerned about it. And he confirmed with me that I was telling the story correctly. Later, I, I showed it again and this time it was a juvenile justice audience and the judge happened to be in the audience, the judge who ended up presiding over this particular case. And uh, she called me and she called me on my cell phone, which was really kind of scary. Um, at that point I was thinking, I, I wish I had listened to my friend and, and stopped showing that image. But she, <laughs> she too confirmed that 
I had told the story correctly. And she also said that she was so concerned and disturbed about what was going on um, with youth across the country that she was going to write a book. So we can go back to the, the cover of the book, Sarah. So she did write the book, and this is her book, and the book came out in 2011. And what she told me during that cell phone call was, was so astonishing and so frightening and so unbelievable that I decided that I would never repeat it unless I could have direct quotes from her. So here are some direct quotes from Judge Irene Sullivan um, in her book, Raised by the Courts. She says, every week in my court, kids are charged as delinquents under criminal statutes written for adults. Only the penalties are, diff are different. Here are a few who have come before me. Ricky threw an egg at a moving vehicle, and he's charged with a felony for throwing a deadly missile. Kira tossed an orange, and she gets the same charge, felony for throwing a deadly missile. Now, just last week I was working with a group, and one of the individuals said, you know, I think most of us are shock, shocked at the, the idea of uh, felony for throwing a deadly missile. And um, I was talking with one judge, and I was saying how it's, it just, it's hard to believe that kids are being charged this way. And he said that he had dealt with a situation in which children were charged. The deadly missile was M&Ms, and he asked just in just, you know, whether it was plain or peanut m and M. But but last week I was working with a group and an individual said, well, you know, if you've ever been hit by, you know, with a, an egg, you know, that somebody has thrown from a moving vehicle, it really hurts. And I think the point is, my point is this, I am sure it hurts. I am sure it is problematic. Our question, my question is, do you want to be the decision maker who decides that the child is going to get a felony or are we going to treat this as kids will be kids' behavior? Are, are you going to be the one who decides that taking a piece of penny candy is going to result in a child being arrested um, and going to, the child being arrested and going to prison? Or are you going to be the one who decides that, that um, this matter can be managed at a much lower level? Um, I want to read one more of these, and then I will go on. Um, Alexia grabbed her friend's cell phone out of her hand at a bus stop and threw it in the grass. She too is charged with felony, with a felony, and it's called robbery by sudden snatching. So hopefully, I'm I'm hoping that I can hear the gasps and awes from those of you who have your phones muted, but. The, I think this information is certainly, certainly worthy of that. Um, so I, I guess the bottom line here is that we have to, you know, I'm not arguing that, that there shouldn't be consequences. Absolutely, we all know that children have to learn boundaries and there, we most definitely have to have consequences to these behaviors. But in, in one situation that I, 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 I dealt with, I had a child who took a piece of penny candy. So we can say that she stole a piece of penny candy. And I contacted the principal and we talked about the fact that this child took a piece of penny candy, which of course we all know is not a good thing, but the child got a three-day suspension for taking a piece of penny candy. The biggest issue here is that she learns right from wrong, and that is the the latent function of education is to teach, to socialize kids in terms of what is appropriate behavior or to reinforce what is appropriate behavior. Um, the, the principal's response to my query about why a three-day suspension, because a three-day suspension means that that child is going to miss three days of a valuable education. In this case, the child was an honor student. She was also involved in after-school programs. She was in a, um, some sort of um, athletic activity after school. And when she missed three, conspe three conse consecutive days, she, she lost her, her place in the honors program. She lost her place in her athletic team. And, but most importantly, as she got older and she started applying for school, 
one of the things that shows up, still shows up on her school record is the suspension. And it doesn't say that she stole, little Julie stole a piece of penny candy. It says theft. And so we have to think about whether or not we're setting these kids up for future failure for the rest of their lives for something that for many of us, things that were handled at a much lower level. Um, the, the principal of this school argued that, you know, we have policies. We have policies that we need to, in fact, his exact statement and his response to me is this. He said, uh, the current policy is in place, and one of the things that we strive to do in our policies is to be as consistent as possible. This helps to ensure that no group, class, or gender is treated unfairly. So what he believes is that applying even an unfair policy is better than nothing. And what I'm saying is that there's no way that you're going to ensure that all students are, are created fairly by applying a policy that is going to dis, dis, um, proportionately impact their lives and their future lives. So we are about at the end. Um, and I just want to talk about a couple of things. I just want to talk about some strategies before we end this and open it up for discussions. And I'm just going to go through them quickly because you can, some of them we've already talked about and certainly you can read them on your own. But I, I want you to think about these things as things that you can do to um, reduce the biases in your schools. Um, so pay attention to language that promotes racial coding, Make sure the language is descriptive and as concise as possible. Avoid vague and ambiguous charges. Make sure, remember that we all have accents. And we should avoid assuming that English language learners um, or other students with distinct ethnic dialects are less intelligent. And um, number five, we should try really hard to be culturally relevant. I think that's one way that we, that's one of the most important ways that we can engage our youth. I know that, that schools have certain um, um, priorities that they have to achieve, but, but to the extent that we can incorporate things that are currently of interest to our students to keep them engaged, I think that also helps reduce some of their frustrations and and actual distractions in the classroom. Um, number five, also we should know that my experience should not be, I should not consider that my experience is going to uni be universal to everybody else. I have a different religi religion or cultural practices, belief systems, child rearing practices, and I should be culturally relevant and not ethnocentric in terms of how I deal with children or students. So we can go on to the next one. Um, I, I think it's very important for us to, at the, at the end of this list, we're going to talk about utilizing um, a racial impact statement. And one of the things we will talk about is to do, to, to monitor or audit our educational environment. Look at posters and ask ourselves of, of those posters and magazines and textbooks reflective of the students and the staffing that, that we have in our schools, or in general, so that students can get accustomed to looking at a multicultural society. Um, I, I'll go down to number eight, be mindful of jokes or, or complaints um, that are commonly shared among school staff. In this one, it's like we have things that have, things that we say that may have racial overtones. In one jurisdiction I worked with, um, the, the, the student population was 50% white, uh, the, the youth population was 50% white, 50% black, and in juvenile hall only 100% of the kids in juvenile hall on that day, 100% of the children were African American. And the, the, the theme, the ongoing theme, or the narrative that I heard over and over again from the people who were working in that juvenile court was that these kids are the worst of the worst, which reinforces the idea that these kids are really, really, really bad, and in some ways connecting that, that idea to race. Um, so we can go on to the next one. Um, so this one is create your own racial impact study. Um, uh, to the right is a cartoon, and this is the, the cartoon that I found in a, a handbook 
in 2013. So this was a handbook that's basically saying, um, making a reference to the decent majority on the right. And this is the jurisdiction that only 100% that, that all all of the children who are in juvenile hall were white kids. So there are, there's a lot of inferences that one could draw from this. But the point is, is that I think every individual, every school needs to think about doing a self-audit or utilizing a racial impact assessment tool. And a racial impact assessment tool is essentially an intervention tool that makes race explicit. And by doing so, makes decision makers aware of potential bias in both policy and practice. And so on this one, I am suggesting that you pay attention to your code of conduct uh, policies, your student handbook, the curriculum after school activities, parent participation, textbooks, etc. Because and and also most importantly, as a teacher, I need to pay attention to my own practice. I need to pay attention to how I make making my decisions, or am I making decisions evenly across racial, ethnic, and social class groups? And by the way, I didn't have a chance to de to develop social class, but it is a very important. It's a very important consideration for us to have as well. So this is essentially this is essentially the work that I wanted to, to share with you. I think that if we're going to put it into the, the school to prison pipe, pipeline, that means that every single one of us has to be involved in this. We know that suspended students are, I mean, the, the consequences are grave. Uh, suspended, stu suspended students are six times more likely to repeat a grade. They're five times more likely to drop out. They're three times more likely to have contact with the juvenile justice system. So it is up to us, each individual, as well as our schools, collectively to keep kids in school and out of court and out of prison. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we are now opening for questions. I know um, someone uh, expressed um, that we should continue to look at that picture of, um, you know, the five-year-old being arrested to to be uncomfortable with that image and and think about that repeatedly as we go um, as we make our own decisions um, and and I think that's a that that is a very interesting and and um, and probably very appropriate sentiment um, so of course I am uh, moving to this last slide just if you have any you know follow-up questions even so we're open for questions now and the webinar will end in about 15 minutes so um, if you want to use your chat function to communicate with both of us um, I will see the questions and read them out and um, we are happy to answer them um, I know that um, a person asked a question about um, a little for a little more information about um, uh, where they can find the quote that you read um, and um, and some of the videos and I think the quote there were many quotes but I remember the question popped up when you read um, I think you were reading the quote about what stereotypes are seen in the media of right right I can find I can find the exact citation for this one and send it okay um, so we'll follow up uh, with Lorraine about that um, and then I think there was another there was a question about um, finding your your videos and um, I don't or or being able to see them again um, I will try to embed them. I was having some difficulty with that earlier, but if I'm able to embed them, then I will do that. If not, I think we could just talk offline about how to get them to people who are interested in, you know, seeing them again. Um, um, Lorraine also said that this was excellent and thanked us. Um, Arusha has a question wondering, are there additional resources aimed at specifically helping teachers reduce the role of implicit bias in decisions made, for instance, decisions about classroom management? Right. Well, in terms of, 
in terms of how to respond to students who you, I, I'm assuming the question has to do about how to respond to students who are acting up. Who yeah. Are, you, yeah. Uh, there are there are resources for that, um, but I I wanted to make sure that people were looking at their own first first and foremost at their own their first response to that because your first response to that your own perception of what's going on is going to to drive the strategy that you use. So I wanted to make sure that people started there by by looking at their own implicit biases, because that will determine what management tool that they then take advantage of. Okay, great. And um, if um, if people do have some questions for you about additional resources about um, reducing implicit bias in um, classroom management decisions, um, are there are there a list that I can send over their way, or should we just have them contact us with? additional questions and um, I'll filter them over to you. Right, definitely. Let's do that. Okay, great. So um, on the slide that's up right now, you can see a picture, um, uh, sorry, not a picture, a slide of um, visiting schooldiscipline.com and also visiting us or you can also call me and leave me a message um, if you have any additional questions that are specific like this one, Arusha, and I will, um, and sorry if I miss pronouncing your name, but I will um, make sure to follow up with you about that afterwards. Um, uh, David asked, um, well, wait, hold on. First, Milton asked if the PowerPoint can be downloaded, and yes, I will send the PowerPoint out in PDF form to everyone um, after um, when, after the PowerPoint is, sorry, after the webinar is available for, um, to be viewed then I send out a whole, um, a whole email with the actual PDF and also the, um, the link to the recording. Um, and um, I wanted to let everyone know also that the, it, the PowerPoint is hyperlinked. So if something is, um, for instance, if you look at the, one of the first slides, this one, um, the civil rights data collection, as you can see, it has it is hyperlinked to the ocrdata.ed.gov, and then the federal school discipline guidance is as well. It goes to the dear colleague letter that kind of details all of the findings. Um, uh, David at, would like more details about how to take the Harvard test on um, our own implicit biases. Mm -hmm. um, I will make sure, so um, I will make sure to include that in the, um, on this slide, on the colorblindness okay. slide. Okay. I'll, I'll include, I'll add that at the end. I'll add the okay. link. Um, and do you want to kind of explain more about what the, um, the, IA, the IAT test does and how it's taken? Well, the, the implicit association test, it gives individuals an opportunity to take a private test that can assess their, their level of unconscious and implicit biases. And I, I mean, there are many different types of tests that you can take. You can do one on gender. We can do one on race and ethnicity. I suggest, you know, on the, for this, the purposes of this webinar that you do the one on race and ethnicity as well. Um, as, as any others that you might be interested in. But I, I think that um, they, th there's literature also online that you can read. A lot of times people want to argue with the validity of the test, but I always say that I'll leave that up to the Harvard researchers because I think it's been very well vetted and very well um, studied in terms of its effectiveness. So I strongly encourage and recommend people take, take the test. And then talk about it with a friend. It's private. It's, it's your, your own experience. And I think many of us have surprises. Right. Um, and I put up, and thanks to Arusha the, 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 um, the, for the link, I put it up um, in the chat function so everyone can see that um, you can visit implicit.harvard.edu to take the implicit bias test um, or implicit association test. Um, 
we actually also on the previous webinar discussed the same test and um, I've taken it and it is you're you're right it's sometimes it can be very surprising yes um, yes <laughs> um, but it's but it's nice to be knowledgeable um, it's, yes. and it's I think more than nice it's imperative that you're knowledgeable yes. about what you're operating with um, and and how that affects your decision making and interactions um, do we have any other questions we have about seven more minutes and we'll still be here um, I see that there are about 40 people still in the room and so I do just before everyone leaves and goes off to lunch, I do really, really, really want to thank um, Dr. Wedding for taking the time out of her day and her days leading up to this to, you know, prepare this and um, and make it um, digestible for everyone in an hour and a half. And um, <laughs> taking, and I know that you were having some hesitance about the, the mode, but you did an awesome job. And so thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, someone asked a question about um, uh, just a little more, getting a little more information about how to create the racial impact study. Um, okay. You know, like kind of what are you looking for when, um, you know, how do you put that together? So exactly. Do you, yeah. Yeah, I can definitely send that. It, and, and you know what, it varies. I've done one for, um, I've the last one I designed was for, for juvenile justice, but they can be used for it. Any discipline, uh, schools is an obvious place for it to be used. I can send you information about that. Okay, fantastic. I can include that in the materials that okay. go out. Great. All right. Well, if um, you have any additional questions, please feel very free to email me. Um, if you have questions for um, um, Dr. Wedding, of course, those you can send those to me, and I will send them to her um, and work on getting answers for you as soon as possible. Um, if um, so, since I haven't seen any other questions, um, please feel free to follow up later if something comes to you, or if you want some more technical assistance. Remember that everything that comes from Fixed School Discipline is free, so feel very free to reach out um, and ask for assistance. Um, you know, even if it's with, you know, more training on this or if you want, you know, something, you know, a different topic that you want to delve further into, um, you know, we're very open to assisting in any way we can. Um, somebody did ask for a way to reach Dr. Wedding directly. Um, uh, Rita, do you mind if I give them your email address? No, that's perfectly fine. Okay, great. Um, and so, actually, could you tell me what it is again? It's D -R yes, it's D-R-R. Okay. C-A-M-W-E-D at A-O-L dot com. So, Dr. R. Cam Webb at A-O-L dot com. Okay, perfect. And I've sent that out to everybody. All right. Then I think, without further ado, we will break for lunch. Great. <laughs> right. Thank you, All Sarah. Right. Thank you. Have okay. a great day, everyone. Yes. Bye-bye.